Hey there, and welcome back to the episode of A Cup of Joe. My name is Joe Escobedo, and I'm really excited. Today on the show, we have Kenneth Chan. Kenneth is the Manager of School Engagement and Marketing at James Cook University here in Singapore. Thanks so much for being on the show, Kenneth. Hey, thanks for having, having me on board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been following you on LinkedIn for a while now. I've been seeing kind of the videos you put out. And we caught up recently because I think higher education has become a very, very competitive space, whether you're private or public. It's, you know, it's, it's tough to get students nowadays, particularly what's going on. So I, in our conversation, you had some very, very interesting ways in which you were kind of battling, say, the incumbents, the, the, the big boys of higher education. And so really want to take this opportunity to find out more about your experience. What are some of the things you're doing differently and, you know, standing out in the market? So I think the, the main thing I've, I've been doing is trying to be a little bit more honest and transparent. Uh, I, I'm taking a bit of a risk by getting students to go on live streams and sharing their honest reviews. And I openly asking them to give me the good well, naturally, <laughs> yeah. but also the bad and the ugly. So I'm, get, I'm getting them to really be authentic about their reviews. So it would, I, I'm trying to avoid things like uh, the typical testimonial videos where it's, uh, it's uh, kind of run of the mill by this time. Uh, I, want a, I want an authentic response from the uh, students and the alumni. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I think it's one of the challenges with testimonials, regardless of whether it's higher education or B2B in general is it's usually the same thing. It looks very staged. It's, it's nice cameras, nice lighting, makeup. They're saying very positive experience. Oh, I love this. <laughs> you know, I love the experience. It was the best ever. But, you know, people are smart. They know that, yes, it could be an amazing experience. But with any experience, there's always downsides. And I love the way that you're kind of, you know, highlighting some of these things that people are talking about anyways, but you're help giving them that showcase to talk about their experiences, both positively and negatively. Um, and I think doing it on a live stream is quite a gutsy move because there's no error for mistake. It's not something where you can just like, hey, stop, you know, unless you like pull them off halfway through. <laughs> so how did you actually come up with the idea to do it, you know, on a live stream? Maybe you share more in terms of the idea and the execution behind it. So uh, one of the reasons I chose a live stream was because it allowed me to do it once and get it over with. Mm. Uh, there's always the concern when it's a... Uh, uh, pre-production and stuff like that, where you could actually do edits, then you, you, have, you have to you know, balance it out and uh, balance between the honesty and authenticity versus what your bosses want to see. Yeah. So it, pro it could be possible that they request for multiple cuts. Uh, well, I, think, I think we should remove that. I think we should, should have asked them this particular question. Could we try that again? So I think it comes across, across as a more scripted and less authentic if it's not a live stream. So that's one of the real reasons I wanted the live stream. It became unfiltered and uncut in a sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, I guess it makes it easier for you because you do have to do the post-production and then, I mean, you have to pre-production, but then all the production just happens on the spot. There's not much room for, for negotiation when it comes to you know, different mm -hmm. topics or different angles and things like that. Um, and once again, going back to the approach, first, I want to find out which channel are you streaming it on? Because I think that's a key element for streaming nowadays, particularly for reaching a younger audience. So which channels were you using? So I was actually just doing it on Zoom. Okay. Because uh, one of the objectives of this was lead generation. <laughs> ah, okay. And um, we, 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 have, we have other uh, avenues for free uh, open content. So, but for this event in particular, this live streaming event, we wanted to generate leads. So uh, it was a, a Zoom, Zoom uh, webinar that required registration. Got it, okay. But in terms of the, the promotions, which, which channels did you leverage to get the uh, word out about the... Uh... So it's the typical social media channels, um, Facebook, Instagram. We haven't um, gone onto TikTok yet, but we are looking into it. <laughs> okay. It's interesting because uh, I think I mentioned before that I'm teaching at, at ESSEC Business School and I was teaching on Monday and I was asking the students, you know, raise your hands, which channel you're active on. And I said, okay, how about Facebook? And it was about 30 students in the class and no hands went up. And I was like, really? Um, so it's interesting to see, I think, you know, half went uh, through Instagram, the other half went through uh, 
went up for TikTok. So it's quite interesting to see the shift in terms of demographic. Facebook is seen as like something for like, you know, the attitude uncles like, like me. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, actually, most of uh, people, yeah. so I actually spoke to some students before and they, they, they kind of shared um, like Facebook is kind of like the, the pub or the bar or the club that they are, that where your parents are going to. So nobody tends to go there anymore, right? It's, it's, it's cool until your parents start, start going to the same places. I, I, so I, to them, yeah. uh, that's Facebook. <laughs> I, I mean, I can definitely relate to that. I mean, I was on Facebook when they just launched and I, as soon as my mom and my aunts got on there, I was like, well, you know, maybe I should probably spend a little bit less time or be more, more wary of what I'm posting. Before I think I just posted whatever. And I was like, I really have to be careful of what I post now because my mom's on here and she's going to see it and my dad's on there. So it's a... Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely shifted. Um, I know one executive who I spoke with recently who was on the podcast previously, and she's now on TikTok, um, but because her 10-year-old daughter is on TikTok. So she wanted as a way to, you know, monitor or kind of see mm-hmm. what was going on because TikTok can be quite racy as well, depending on the, the mm-hmm. content they're producing. Um, okay, so that that makes sense. So I was le- leveraging the regular social media channels. And Take, take me through the, the content itself. I know you had kind of students. You also had industry experts, if I'm not mistaken. Was that on the same podcast or so the same live stream? Or was that something different? So it was a week-long event. Um, the industry experts came on a separate uh, separate week, separate series. Okay. So the live stream event uh, really focused on the school itself, the university itself. So I got the academics, uh, colleagues from the learning support, and I got current students and alumni to give their feedback. Mm. But separately, I, I conceptualized the, uh, an event called Career X where I brought in industry experts to talk about the industry itself rather than to try and sell my courses. Mm. So it's more of selling the idea that this uh, is what the industry is like and then trying to you know, subtly link it to the programs that we offer at the university. And I think that makes sense because at the end of the day, you know, like any industry, you don't want to be accused of hard selling. So really pushing the programs because, you know, there may on paper may not be a huge difference between, you know, what you're offering with the other offering. But I think what they want to see is, like you said, the experience. Part of that experience is, is showcasing the industry expert, people who have been through the program and also sharing what it's actually like. Because I think this is something I try to do as well with my students and saying, look, I, you know, digital marketing is great. Social media is great. It can definitely have a huge impact on your career, your life. But there is a downside of it. Um, there's challenges, there's struggles. So, and I know something you you touched on in your your live stream as well. And the industry expert side is really showcasing the real side of once you graduate, what actually happens. Yes. So, uh, what what one of one uh, one particular industry expert stands out. Uh, he's he, he's a data scientist, so he actually mentioned um, uh, the realities of being a data analyst, data scientist. So I asked him, all right, so we normally hear the 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 the, uh, the the great stories about how it's the future and how everyone should be rushing to do this. But I asked him uh, up front, what are the downsides? It can't, it can't possibly be all good. So he shared that actually he spends 80% of it time cleaning data, looking through spreadsheets, looking through data uh, and try to uh, make sense and make sure that it actually can uh, be crunched. And that's 80% of the job, but we always hear about the 20%, the glamorous stuff, the data visualization that we show to the bosses and the bosses give you credit for. But no one wants to do the 80% of the work behind the scenes, probably uh, doing overtime, uh, trying to clean messy data. Exactly. That's a very good point. I think that goes across all different, you know, industries and, and job roles is 80% is can be quite boring and repetitive and maybe something not super glamorous. 20% is why we pursue that. Um, it's interesting, like I said, that, that you allow them to share that because once again, this has an impact in terms of the perception of that program, not necessarily the program, but that, that, that job function as well. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, was there any hesitation from the internal team, maybe the leaders on having people share such unfiltered feedback on whether it's the industry or even their experience in the school? Definitely, there, 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 there were many doubts, <laughs> but 
it, it, it took a couple of years for me to get to this point. Mm. So in the earlier stages, uh, I guess I was all those uh, young and enthusiastic people uh, trying to push through all the ideas. But then uh, I realized that I haven't made a name for myself. So thankfully, I had a good mentor. So my manager actually shared that, you know, perhaps we could meet them halfway, so to speak. So he, he suggested that, uh, why don't we just try to hit the targets and the uh, KPI set by uh, senior management first to mm. prove that we can do the job, then we go further. So we do the bare minimum, give them what they want. Then uh, it, took, it took a lot of extra effort. We, we did stuff uh, on the weekends and after office hours, but we showed them that, yes, we can do what you want, but we can actually bring it further. So it allowed us to build trust. Uh, on hindsight, looking back, I could see that, okay, so senior management just hired this, uh, at that time, was just a senior executive who has never proven himself in the first uh, couple of months. And here he is trying to give ideas on how to improve the business. Mm. So as a manager now, I can see, okay, yes. So it, it com comes across uh, as, um, okay, so this guy is so new to the organization. What does he know about what we need? Mm. Yeah, but hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very interesting point around trust, particularly with a with a new hire. I think one thing that always came up in my career was this concept of quick wins. So, what kind of quick wins, little small wins, can you showcase within your first quarter during probation to make sure that you are showcasing that you are trustworthy, you're able to to deliver on what you say? Um, I think that's a challenge with a lot of people. They focus on what can we do different. So, I like your approach of you know ticking the box, making sure that you actually get the job done first and then layering on top of that. And I think if you bring up another good point in terms of managing expectations, because a lot of people, when they hear this, they think, oh, I'm gonna go straight to my you know, board of directors and my CEO or Dean, and I'm gonna just be able to deliver this like this. But in your, your case, you said it took a couple of years to really convince them um, about the new ideas and new direction you had. Um, so once again, I'd love to di dive a bit deeper because I know a lot of people are gonna be asking, how did you actually get that buy-in? I mean, doing the job is one thing, but how did you actually sell in something as unconventional is a live unfiltered session where you know students and alumni really let everything out so it's uh, I, I think it's always like the story about the frog in the hot water you, you put them in the pot and you heat the water slowly they get used to it so they don't know that they are being cooked alive uh, so it's kind of what I did with senior management over here um, at the beginning, I, I guess I had youthful idealism. I tried to push my ideas through. So I kept pushing the ideas, but what I did was allow the ideas to get watered down. So I, I wanted a really bombastic idea, but once I pitched it to my manager, he would give uh, some, he had some hesitations that maybe he watered it down a little. Then mm. he submitted it to the director of marketing who perhaps has had even more hesitations about the ideas and then we changed it. So the final idea, the final product that we actually started work on ended up becoming quite different from the original idea. Uh, but over time, as more and more ideas go through and more, of them, more and more of them succeed, I guess it, it, it took a couple of years just for, it didn't, it, didn't go, it didn't get accepted overnight. So it took, a couple of years of trying different ideas and getting them to accept different levels of ideas. Slowly, um, the ideas become more and more towards, uh, how, to, how to put it? <clears throat> the ideas became more, the ideas that got approved became more like the original ideas that I was pitching. But mm -hmm. that took some time, yeah. I guess it also has the trust. Um, early on, I think in 2019, one of the, biggest breakthroughs I had was actually getting my entire team trained as uh, jobs and career transition coaches. Mm -hmm. So while we are doing the uh, admissions and enrollments consultations, I figured um, most people come to uni because they want to get a job. Yeah. So why not train ourselves as career coaches in a sense? So we got that done and we came out with an article in the Straits Times mm -hmm. and I was interviewed and one of the things I just casually said was um, by going through this uh, course, we actually learned to tell people that 
James Cook University is not the best university for everyone. It may not even be the right university for you. And it was put into the article. I was quite uh, surprised that uh, my director approved it because it was the first line in the article. It actually said something along the lines of uh, James Cook University may not be the right place for you. <laughs> and that was the first line in the article that was approved. So that was the first major milestone. And subsequent, subsequently, it became a little bit more uh, easier just to get things approved. I, I mean, there's so many interesting points in what you just mentioned, one of which I think was, I'm, but I'm reading in the book, um, Influence, that you kind of mentioned uh. on is starting with these kind of crazy ideas, which you know will probably get rejected, but then you're setting the context up for the leadership team. They're saying, okay, we won't agree to that, but since we declined this one, we will pursue a one that's probably not as crazy and probably more feasible. So it sounds like you did something similar to that um, in the book. And I think going back to transparency and, and honesty, I think saying, once again, you're not the best, you're not right fit, it can be scary for a lot of brands because for them, it's like them saying, okay, we're not the best, and acknowledging that. Um, and it's really, really tough because most brands, most brand managers think they are the best brand in the world when, you know, it's, it goes back to perception. And if you say you're the most best brand, but, you know, all your audience disagrees with you or they think, oh, maybe you're in the top 10 or top 20, that's fine. But I think knowing your place and, and, and sticking to it and then being honest about it does have an impact. And it goes back to, you know, I, as if, if I was a student, I feel like I would trust you more because you would say, look, it's not right for you. And I, I try to, to do the same thing in my, my company as well in terms of setting the expectations. I say, okay, here's what we do. If this is not what you're looking for, then there's other you know, players in the field that you could be pursuing and, and working with. So I think one thing that's been a common trend in what you've been discussing is really setting expectations throughout the entire the entire phase. So setting expectations once you graduate, setting expectations you know, once you join the program, what is it actually going to be like? Such that when they jump in, they're not being like, oh, you oversold me something. And now it's kind of, I'm a bit disappointed. So I think that helps in terms of setting expectations. Um, another thing that I really want to highlight again, which I think is really great, is your team being trained on, I forgot the term, but, you know, job consultants or job experts. And because end goal in mind, if you ask, like you said, most people in college or higher education, college or high, in your university is a stepping stone for a new job. So by having that end in mind, you can work backwards and say, okay, look, what do we need to do to get you at a job at this company or this type of industry, what, whatever it is. Um, I think that is a smart move of looking at it. You know, if you look at the uh, student life cycle, that's a huge part of it is what happens post um, university. And I, I've been having my own struggles with my own university that I graduated from, because once I graduated, I was kind of like, you know, there was, there was no communications except for, can you give me money? Um, <laughs> so not, not the most positive experience um, in, in my case. And, um, but I, so I like that once again, you guys are helping set students up for what that next move could look like. Yeah, but I think building on that, it, it really requires uh, management to as, accept the facts. I, I think uh, when it comes to university education, a lot of people are or in the education sector are wary that we don't want it to become vocational education. Mm. But when so many people are coming to, to, to you with this angle in mind, um, you, have to, you have to kind of, you know, uh, you know, the customer is king, right? And mm -hmm. in this sense, the prospective students and the students are in a sense, the customers of the education sector. Mm. But, uh, also, it was, I also came to this realization by probing. So when, when, when we have consultations with students, we ask them, um, so what, why do you want to do this particular program or why do you want to choose this particular uh, range of uh, universities? Mm. They will tell you, oh, because of the ranking, the prestige. But ultimately, it's because they, they see it as a means for them to get employed. It gives you higher social status, but this social status will allow you to get a job easily mm, so yeah. ultimately that's 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 what we got through probing and i think that's where the training as a career consultants uh, the jobs and career transition coaches really helped us mm. no i think that's i mean at the end of the day 
I was shooting a course on this right before we we uh, shot this and how to get inside your audience's head. And I think that's one thing is is asking those questions. What are you actually looking to get out of this program? Well, what, what, why even sign up to begin with? And if it is, you know, to get a job at this company, get this type of role, then why not make sure that you are doing your best to help the students achieve that objective? So it makes perfect sense to me. Yes, I was, I'm also fortunate to have some really good mentors. At my first organization, I joined the, the marketing director, the head of marketing actually told us, um, you shouldn't be hard selling education because these are people's lives and futures we're dealing with. Mm. That really stuck with me for my entire career. Uh, it was my first job, so I guess I was more impressionable back, impressionable back then. And yeah. it's uh, something, it's my mantra uh, even till now. So I, uh, I think he's now uh, the head of uh, learning at ACCA. Mm -hmm. So uh, if Steve is listening, uh, shout out to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, to share this with Steve after this. Um, but I think it's it's good advice regardless of what industry you're in. I mean, we do a lot of in B2B tech and it's the same thing. You see a lot of players who are hard selling and it actually has a detrimental effect in terms of the brand image and perception. So I'm a big proponent against hard selling, whether you know, you're in education or any industry. But I think it goes back to what you're saying. It, it is people's lives at the end of the day, professional or personal lives. So you have to have that in mind when you are communicating them and selling something to them that you know is ultimately going to have an impact in their, their lives down the road so really really good advice kenneth i really appreciate you sharing kind of the story and the journey behind it i know it wasn't easy so once again i appreciate you sharing um one question that we're starting to ask now is finding out more about kind of because you're big on self-learning what's something that you are either watching reading or listening to at the moment it's a podcast it's a youtube what what, what do you consuming in terms of content uh so I, i've been reading ebooks i'm using the uh nlb mobile app so i've been downloading books i actually read uh, influence through the, the app i've ah, been trying okay. to buy myself a copy as well but it's quite expensive trying to get some secondhand versions you know <laughs> i yes it, it, it is it is very very expensive but i think um i i just found out about that recently then i'll be so national library board app here in singapore mm -hmm. you can get basically a lot of the free free books uh ebooks yep. i was quite surprised as well too so i i prefer i'm an old school guy i like to, to handle it but i think if you're on a budget i think that's a great great app for anyone listening to this yeah during the um the whole circuit breaker and because of the pandemic i pretty much i think i finished about 21 books in 2020 Wow. I, I read Seth Godin uh even Gary Vaynerchuk's book uh Robert Ch Chardini's book a whole lot more. I, I think there's like 21. I need to check the history in my app. <laughs> All right. So since you've read 21 books over the past year, what which one was the most practical or had the biggest impact in terms of your professional career? Um, I think there were two that really uh, left uh, left an impression. Purple Cow by Seth Godin and okay. uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini. So these are the two that really, I think, I would have started with this if I had known they were that good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to check out Purple Cow because I've, I've heard a lot of good things about Seth Godin's books. I haven't read them personally, but uh, Purple Cow is now on my, on my list to, to purchase. So <laughs> thank you for that, Kenneth. Uh, last question is, how can people get in touch with you? If you wanna find out more about you and what you do? So it's uh, best to get in touch with me on LinkedIn. Just search for Kenneth Chan and I work at James Cook University. So just add to the math. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kenneth. I really, really appreciate you sharing your story and your experiences with us today. Yeah, welcome. Happy to be on the show. Awesome. My pleasure. And if you're watching or listening to this, do feel free to share it with your colleagues, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Later.